let's get started and I'll share with you all about our e Egypt in the Nile program for next year. A couple of quick words about Wheel and Anchor, a few new pictures that we've added there from recent trips over the last couple of months. We are a community of travelers from all across Canada and our mission is to bring people together for um, wonderful, uh, very carefully curated experiences that allow you to see the world at a little bit of a slower pace where possible um, than uh, a lot of the other travel programs, the organized tour programs that you see out there, and also to connect with our other amazing members. And, uh, you know, we're in the meantime, um, um, over 12,000 uh, people who have joined our community uh, and who uh, um, many of whom participate uh, in our trips uh, month after month and year after year. And we uh, love the, the fact that we are we're growing and what brings us together is the fact that we have this like minded view of travel and how to see the world and and how to um, uh, how to enjoy it and how to explore without um, um, without being um, too obtuse about it. I'm not sure if that's the right word that I want to use, but <laughs> but um, it is that uh, that common um, uh, approach to to uh, to travel and exploring the world that that makes us a community. And uh, as I say, we we continually get great feedback about um, uh, about how we run our trips and about the great people. And you know, it's funny. I'm here hosting a group now in Madeira in Portugal, um, and people are commenting today. It's like it's remarkable how everybody here seems so like minded. Um, and I and and that to me is the sign that we are doing our job, um, making sure that you have the ability to become well traveled. Um, and in our world, well traveled is not about qu uh, quantity, but rather quality, and that you um, have the time to really experience and. You know, as the old saying goes, stop and smell the roses. That um, means that you will have so much more that you take with you home um, from these experiences and the connections that you make to uh, to your fellow members and the people along the way. If we've done that, we've done our job. That's where we're about uh, at Wheel and Anchor. And I'm just uh, going to share with you a few photos from the group um, that has uh, literally just returned from um, Egypt recently uh, there with the pyramids in the back and uh uh, some of the temples. Uh, this is, I believe, the Karnak Temple in Luxor, uh, as well as um, uh, Saqqara down near the pyramids outside of Cairo. Uh, they had a really incredible time. Of course, the highlight being our cruise down the Nile on our um, privately chartered Dahabia that I'll tell you all about in a few moments. Um, the, the feedback I got, some of the comments I got were absolutely amazing trip once in a lifetime and most of all an amazing host um, that's what makes our trips so, so special and I'm going to go back uh, two slides here our host is oh, not in this picture but he is in one of them uh, where is Mr. Eunice there he's down at the bottom right um, we have an Egyptologist who we have um, taken on board and and befriended and he's befriended us Canadians since we first traveled with him uh, before COVID and he re remarked to me after that very first trip how much he enjoys so much um, traveling with the Canadians. It's a totally different dynamic than um, some of the other nationalities that he tours around Egypt. And he looks forward every year um, to uh, to uh, to being the, the host and guide of our trip. Um, and this year, again, the, the the commentary from our members was, wow, that he does really announce he goes beyond uh, the call of duty. And not only because of his knowledge of Egypt and, you know, he is a certified Egyptologist, but also his ability to convey what life in Egypt, day-to-day uh, -day life is all about. And that's such an important part of it because this is more than just the history. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, brief introduction to our team if you haven't um, met us before. My name is Gordon Dreger. I'm the founder of Wheel and & Anchor, um, and I curate pretty much all the itineraries that we offer here uh, and uh, I have a growing team of amazing people that make this all possible. And those who you will likely most uh, likely come in contact with are our trip specialists, Paula and Barb, uh, who are the ones that are on the other end of the phone, taking your calls, answering your questions and making sure that you have all the info you need 
to join us on um, this or any of our trips. Our agenda today, as with all of our webinars, we're going to take you on a little relaxing digital trip around Egypt, down the Nile, uh, and I'm going to show you the way and uh, talk a, few, a little bit about some of the highlights of this trip, um, where we're going to be heading back in March of 2025. Um, on other webinars, we've had Eunice, uh, our Egyptologist, join us. Unfortunately, he's in the middle of high season at the moment and super busy, and he sends his regrets that he couldn't join us on this webinar. Um, but if you are curious, what he sounds like, or uh, you you can also always tune into one of our uh, our previous webinars on Egypt, where he has uh, had the time to uh, to join us uh, and uh, has shared some of the experiences that he delivers to our members on this trip. Um, the program, of course, takes place here um, in the northeastern part of Egypt in the Nile Valley, beginning and ending in Cairo, of course, the capital of Egypt. Um, and so we focus on Cairo itself, and then we focus on that section of the Nile that is um, most popular for cruising, that is between Luxor and the High Dam at Aswan. We sail both uh, upstream and then back downstream um, from starting and ending in Luxor, and then uh, the trip again, we fly from there, from Cairo. Um, and I, I want to make a quick point here because, you know, people ask us quite a bit about, oh, the situation in the Middle East, um, what's going on there. Of course, um, if we look at the little inset map here, um, you've got um, uh, Israel and, and Gaza, of course, here, which are um, next to uh, Egypt uh, on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. This is the Sinai Peninsula here for your uh, geography lesson. It is... Um, separated from the rest of Egypt by uh, the uh, uh, by the Suez Canal, which of course connects the Mediterranean and the Red Sea here, um, and uh, all of the the troubles that have been happening, of course, are up in this part of the Middle East, and there has been literally no effect um, in Egypt thus far. We hope it stays that way, uh, and uh, so you know uh, anyone considering joining this trip if that's a consideration um and listen we understand safety security that's obviously first and foremost in our minds but um life in egypt and travel to egypt as attested by our members who've um, been along on this trip this year unaffected by the situation over there so i just thought i'd remark on that because it is a question that has um come up from time to time what's happening you know we're in the middle east um, but we are far away from, from all the terrible stuff that's happening over there. Let's go through the day-by-day -day itinerary, um, starting with Cairo, of course, where you can fly into. In the meantime, well, I shouldn't say in the meantime, for some years now, uh, Egypt Air offers a nonstop flight from Toronto to Cairo, which is a great way uh, to fly in. And uh, that's an airline that is really up their game. Uh, you know, if you would have asked me 15 years ago, I'd say there's no way in heck I would have flown Egypt Air, but they have brand new aircraft, wonderful service on board. Uh, so it definitely rivals our own domestic carriers at home. But of course, if you're traveling from other places in Canada, there are um, a numerous uh, ways to get to, to Cairo via European gateways like Frankfurt, Amsterdam, London, and so on. So either way, when you arrive in Cairo, of course, you're met by our friendly drivers and brought downtown to um, your hotel, uh, where we will be um, staying for the first few nights in this very hustle bustle city. Now, listen, you've heard stories about Cairo, um, what it's all about, um, and it is as frenetic as... Uh, <laughs> probably as your imagination or as pictures that you may have seen. Um, but we're going to be holding up um, here uh, 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 new this year. We're returning back downtown on previous trips on, and on some upcoming trips. We've stayed out at uh, out at the out in Giza at the pyramids at an excellent hotel, the Mena House, um, which is really first class. Um, uh, we decided for a little bit of change of pace because, you know, I like to change things up, never, never stay the same. Um, we are heading back downtown and staying at the Ritz-Carlton, the Nile Ritz-Carlton, which is um, right on the bank of the Nile River, of course, um, and uh, adjacent to Tahrir Square, which is the main square um, of Cairo. Um, you'll probably be familiar with the name if you remember back during the Arab uprisings. That's where, you know, all the people came out and demonstrated in Cairo. Those things don't happen these days anymore. Thanks very much. Um, but the Ritz-Carlton, as with 
um, all of the hotels in the Ritz Carlton brand. I'm not a ch fan of chains, generally speaking, but when you're in a place like Cairo, uh, it's it's nice to uh, call a place like this home. It is a first class hotel. This is for those of you who may have traveled in Egypt, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, way back uh, when, when it was a totally different place. This is what used to be called the Nile Hilton, which was very, very famous um, hotel for, for a number of different reasons. And um, the hotel sort of, uh, as as they do when they're not looked after over time, sort of fell into disrepair and was completely gutted and refurbished and and taken over by the Ritz Carlton Group um, in the last decade, um, and it is now a spectacular five star hotel, um, perfectly located. Again, you can see the square in the back out the window here. So on the back, you've got uh, Tahrir Square, the main square of Cairo, and in the front, you're facing out onto the Nile, a great place to call home for a few nights um, while we're in Cairo. Of course, we're going to see the major highlights while there. We're going to make a trek out to um, the pyramids at Giza. That is um, undoubtedly one of the top things that one comes to see. And, you know, the pyramids... For me, I can best describe it that, you know, there's what we learned in school about, uh, you know, the pyramids and the pharaohs and all the rest of it. And there's what you learn on site when you actually stand in front of these things and you look up and you realize the geometric precision and the alignment. In fact, it's given rise to so many conspiracy theories about how these things were actually created. Were they even built by humans? Anyway, I'm not going to venture into that road, um, but it's actually worth um, prior to going to Egypt, or even if you're just sort of contemplating, toying with the idea of going, is, you know, read up a little bit, um, watch some YouTube videos um, about, uh, you know, the history of the of the pyramids and the various speculation that's gone uh, around them. But um, spending, uh, you know, the few hours there that we do is... Uh, is is one of those highlights that you'll never really forget. For those that aren't too claustrophobic, you can actually climb inside the pyramid. There is a um, an access uh, tunnel that takes you right into the middle of the pyramid, um, which quite honestly, there isn't much to see in there except you're surrounded by a pyramid. Um, but to say that you've been inside is, 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 a, is an incredible rite of passage. And for others, it's riding a camel um, uh, across the uh, the desert. And when you look at the picture as well, it looks like, oh, the pyramids are out in the middle of nowhere, but they really are frankly in a suburb of, of Egypt, specifically in Giza. Um, and so from where this picture is taken, um, it's basically all sort of buildings, but the, the area around the uh, pyramids has been so um, beautifully preserved. And we'll stop at a couple of other sites uh, there as well. Uh, uh, like Saqqara, which is uh, uh, has the, the first temple in, in Egypt that even predates the pyramids at Giza. So you're going to see some of the most important archaeological sites that Egypt has to offer. The other big reason to go to uh, Cairo is, of course, the Grand Egyptian Museum. Now, I'm going to caveat by this by saying the Grand Egyptian Museum, um, they started construction on this thing over 10 years ago. And it is the uh, when it is ultimately fully opened, because it was actually due to open already uh, before COVID, when, I, when we took our first wheel and anchor group there in 2019, so just before the start of the pandemic, um, um, it was supposed to have been open in time, and it didn't. Uh, and then, of course, the COVID uh, sort of interrupted all of that. And then it was going to open right after the end of COVID. Um, and up till today, it still hasn't op fully opened its doors. Uh, there are certain halls that have, have a limited um, uh, admittance. But um, they are saying that within the course of this year, the museum, which cost over a billion dollars and is the largest, by far the largest, uh, 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 museum on uh, Egyptian um, artifacts with over 100,000 pieces. Um, it will open sometime during the course of this year. So by next March, um, you will almost certainly, because, you know, when it comes to this, you there's nothing we can say with absolute certainty, but you will be uh, able to visit the Grand Egyptian Museum, um, which will, of course, feature a huge section on Tutankhamun uh, himself, King Tut, uh, that is the reason that a lot of people visit the existing um, Egyptian museum, which is actually really well done, uh, even though it's somewhat dated and small in comparison to this new museum that is uh, not far from the pyramids, as you can see in the picture. Uh, and, um, you know, this 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 picture that we've chosen here, you can see some of the construction activity. It is largely, if you look at it from the outside, it looks like it's done um, and it's almost done. 
Uh, but you know, they're just, they're still polishing the edges or something. Um, from Cairo, of course, we fly down to Luxor. Um, it's not a long flight where we will join our Dahabiya. And this is again, what sets this program apart. Um, uh, the vast majority of vessels, there's over a hundred river crew, cru river cruise vessels that, uh, ply the waters between Luxor and Aswan. Uh, we opted, uh, starting, a year ago or a year and a half ago to uh to work with a a company that uh that um has has built this brand new it was just actually just completed in the end of 2022 this Dahabia. a Dahabia is the original vessel that was used by uh the um uh the the, the emperors uh the nobility from um, um back uh, in the day of the feluccas that's why it still has a sail on the front of it even though that's not really an operational it's more for decoration this was how they um cruised up and down the nile river and so the dahabia with only uh, a total of uh 14 uh cabins um, is chartered exclusively by ourselves for this program, um, which means it's just you and your other fellow Wheel and Anchor members and our crew on board. And uh, of course, Eunice, your Egyptologist, that um, means that it's a very intimate experience. Um, of course, they've got, you know, wonderful both outdoor and indoor amenities. You can sit here in a lounger during the times when you're not out exploring the various sites along the Nile um, and just sort of soak in the warm Egyptian sun, take a dip in the pool um, that is also on board. Um, enjoy the fantastic food. Um, and uh, when we uh, when this uh, trip just came back, as I say, last week, uh, uh, I was I was curious because it was the, uh, the 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 second trip that I guess that we've had on this Dahabia since it was launched, uh, and uh, the the reviews, um, much to my delight, were that the food was absolutely um, extraordinary, out of this world, and um, so we 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 food and dining is is very important to us at Wheel and Anchor, and we've been able to up, uphold this in. Uh, um, to a great degree on board this Dahabia. There's a couple of different cabin categories. Some of them have small balconies or Juliet balconies like this one, but all in all, you're in for a very comfortable experience on board this uh, ship. Um, obviously all private amenities. Uh, this is really the way to cruise the Nile. And also being on a smaller ship allows us to stop at at least one site, if not others, that the the larger ships simply aren't able to stop at, and that means that you can have some experiences um, that are, and I'll I'll talk about one of them in just a second, that are that are a little bit different than those on the the typical um, Nile cruise. And you know, not not to say that there aren't other very nice ships along the Nile, but having your own private one is is definitely a benefit. Uh, one of the first things that we'll see in Luxor, of course, is venturing to the Valley of the Kings. The Valley of the Kings, of course, there's a Valley of the Kings and a Valley of the Queens. Um, this is really the most famous archaeological site in the world. This is where uh, originally the, the tomb of, of um, Tutankhamun was discovered. Um, you'll see uh, that tomb as well as a number of other tombs. Um, and what I want to point out here is that uh, one of the things that we put emphasis on is uh, we make uh, arrangements to visit there are roughly five tombs that are the in the typical Valley of the Kings Pass, if you will. Um, and then there are a number of other tombs that are closed off except for, by special private arrangement. And we will visit one of them, the Seti, the first tomb um, that is, uh, and again, based on the feedback from our members, is the most extraordinary uh, of, of, of well-preserved Egyptian tombs, tombs that you will find. And so we get um, special... Um, uh, permission. We get a special ad admission. Um, in fact, it, it's it's quite expensive to arrange that, um, and uh, uh, that that it will be undoubtedly, as far as one of the uh, one of the tombs, one of the absolute highlights um, of this trip. Um, we'll visit uh, the tomb of uh, Hatshepsut, which is another one of the famous ones. I didn't put pictures up of all of them. Some of them will be familiar to you from, you know, having browsed through National Geographic or or seen documentaries on it. Um, but there's so much here. The thing that I want to highlight about this is, is that, um, you know, the risk is with any type of a tour that is 
you know, focuses on a lot of historical sites. Because I mean, let's let's face it, we're 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 delving into ancient Egyptian history, thousands of years old. Um, but the 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 huge benefit here is that you have. Uh, someone like Eunice, who is able to weave the whole story of Egyptian history into such uh, a, a fantastic narrative about how one pharaoh relates to the other and um, and how one temple relates to the other and what happened here. And it is fantastic. And I must say that everything that I had learned in school and long since forgotten was uh, completely um, um, redrawn for me, for lack of a better word, by by actually seeing these things up front. I mean, the Edfu Temple, of course, is uh, another one that was quite known because the whole thing was preserved since it was buried in sand right up to the roof. Um, and so uh, when they finally discovered this temple and then gradually excavated it, shovel by shovel, as it were, um, it meant that some of the um, um, engravings uh, and some of the now I forget the name of some of the reverse engravings that you see, for example, featured here, the level of detail in these things. And if you consider at the that time in, you know, the evolution of mankind, what was involved, it is truly, truly mar remarkable. Gebel el Cecila is actually one of the quarries where uh, many, uh, where much of the stone that was used in these incredible statues, um, like Abu Simbel, for example, and others, um, was was core was was mined uh, for for all these temples. Um, it uh, this is one of the stops that we will make with the Dahabia, the, the big river cruise ships. The the pier isn't large enough to accommodate the the regular size Nile cruisers, so we get to stop in here uh, and uh, explore uh, this this very very special place along the way. Um, we'll after a couple of days we'll arrive in Aswan. Um, uh, so you know the journey between Luxor and Aswan is not all that far. There's tons to see along the way. Um, when we get to Aswan, uh, which is of course where the Nile River is separated from the Upper Nile from the Lower Nile uh, by the the High Aswan Dam, which you'll probably remember was built back in the '60s or uh, was completed in 1970 uh, and uh, was a uh, quite controversial at the time. Um, now, of course, they're building another dam further upstream uh, in Ethiopia, which is even more controversial. But um, nevertheless, our arriving in Aswan enables us to sort of see how um, life is in this city that largely was, you know, it, it had a, a history it, during of the Nubians that predated, of course, the dam. And many of them, thousands upon thousands of them were displaced when they built the dam. Um, and so we get to hear all about that. We visit the Temple of Karnak, um, the Crocodile Temple uh, that is uh, here in Aswan. Um, we'll uh, have a high tea experience at the old Cataract Hotel that overlooks uh, the uh, the river. Um, so some very, very special experiences that are in store for you um, while uh, the couple of nights that we're in as one. One of those is an optional side trip to Abu Simbel. So Abu Simbel, um, is at the other end of Lake Nasser. Um, lake Nasser, of course, being the lake that was formed when the Aswan High Dam was built. Uh, and it is a huge, gigantic lake. I mean, you fly for um, almost an hour from Aswan to the south, to almost to the, to the very south of Egypt, almost at the border of Sudan. Um, and uh, we offer this as a side trip for those that... And, and everybody that goes on this trip says, why don't you just include this in the program? Well, it's a good question. Maybe not everybody wants to uh, to, uh, to to do the side trip. They just want to take a rest and um, explore Aswan, which is in interesting in and of itself. But Abu Simbel is amazing because of these gigantic um, uh, statues that were built um, and that are um, uh, that what what makes them particularly famous is obviously the, the 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 size of them, the grandeur of them is one thing. But then when you realize that these were actually relocated um, uh, from their original site, which was on the uh, banks of the Nile River, but would have been completely flooded by uh, by Lake Nasser when they built the dam, um, and piece by piece um, over a period of five years. Um, with 3,000 people, they moved um, this uh, incredible temple uh, depicting King Ramses II uh, from its original location to where it is now. And that that makes it even more worthwhile to visit. You can actually go inside the temple um, and the other a temple that is adjacent to it. It is really, really an amazing site. So there's a whole day devoted to that. Um, and 
but other things to do for those that would prefer to uh, stick around in as one. Um, after uh, our second night in as one, we are heading back downstream towards Luxor. Um, and a comment that was made to me, one of the highlights of the trip that we never really talk about in, is stopping at the lock. So we actually will lock through on the Nile at, uh, at Esna. Um, and it's here that a very funny practice, and I'll, I'll let you in on this because because some members had commented that they said we should really mention this because they thought it was a lot of fun. But when the ship is uh, um, entering, when the Dahabi is entering the lock, um, and as you're going through, you'll have these um, local merchants on small little craft um, that are basically... Um, yelling up at the boat and sort of trying to sell you various wares from, you know, anything from T-shirts and they'll toss the stuff up onto the boat. And then, you know, if you, you know, you can open it up and look at it. And then if you want to keep it, you, you, you know, th there's a little pouch in there. You put some money inside and you toss it back down on this whole activity goes on for the whole period as you're transiting through the locks. It's a lot of fun um, and sort of part of this whole experience. You, you can't not buy something from these guys. So they're actually very good businessmen. Uh, uh, the ones that do that. Um, we'll end up back at uh, uh, Luxor where we'll disembark our ship before heading back to Cairo. But I want to mention as well that the opportunity will exist because we're on board the boat for a whole seven nights. The opportunity will also exist to do a hot air balloon ride, um, which is optional and uh, obviously weather dependent over the Valley of the Kings and Queens. Um, I know that when I when I uh, went on the trip um Oh God, it's four years ago now. Uh, it was um, uh, it was slightly too windy that day. So unfortunately we were not able to go up in the balloons, but I think they were able to go up this year. Um, and once again, to go hot air ballooning over the um, most famous archeological site, it, certainly in Egypt, if not the whole world um, is uh, absolutely a treat. So we'll fly back to Cairo, spend one more night there um, before making our way um, onward. Uh, this program is run in conjunction with our Jordan program uh, or uh, to continue back um, home to Canada. So that's basically our program. Um, in a nutshell, this is, uh, as I say, is, I think we've perfected running this program and we certainly have uh, uh, one of the best guys to uh, lead us on it, uh, our Egyptologist Eunice. Uh, so the details, of course, are all in the program itinerary. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look, I'll just summarize it here. Um, we have three different categories that we offer. Uh, our, our deluxe cabins with no balcony, with a small balcony, and then our larger suites uh, with a sitting balcony. Um, all of our prices, of course, in Canadian dollars. Um, and we try to make it as attractive as possible for uh, those solo travelers, we have many in our membership that are interested in participating. And um, we know nobody likes the single supplement, least of all me, uh, but it is a, it's a function of the industry that we can't seem to get away from. Um, lots of inclusions in this program. Um, of course, uh, your cruise and uh, four nights of truly luxury accommodation in Cairo, as well as seven nights on board the ship, um, your domestic flights, um, all of the guiding, the gratuities, um, all of your meals on board is all part of this program. And again, it's detailed in the program itinerary. We will assist you with international airfare, uh, as well as uh, uh, sign you up for Abu Simbel and uh, um, insurance. Those are the only things that are extra uh, for those that wish to join this program. If you sign up early enough, uh, we, uh, we we always get a bit of a, well, I shouldn't say always, but typically we get a bit of a deal um, if we uh, pay our deposits in early enough. So we pass that on to our members. So you get a couple hundred dollars on top of all of that if you join early. Um, the Our Egypt program, Egypt has become very popular again. So our, uh, thankfully our programs have all sold out recently. So we do uh, suggest you consider booking early. Uh, March is a great time to go, and I'll um, I'll touch on that in a moment because it will always come up um, within the question section. Um, but of course, uh, uh, we're, I'm about to take any questions that you might have about this trip, uh, and uh, it's always the questions that pop up um, ten minutes after the webinar is over. But that's uh, how you why you can email Paula or Barb, and they'll make sure that your questions are all answered. So. Um, let's see, have any questions come in, Paula, either pre we prior to the webinar? 
Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I've got a list already. That's good. Oh, okay, <laughs> perfect. Up, no. So we'll we'll work our way through them. Um, member was asking, what differences are there in traveling to Egypt during Ramadan? Ah, oh, yeah, good question. Yes, thank you. Experience. The Ramadan. Yes. Yeah. So next year in March, it is Ramadan, uh, which is uh, obviously the Muslim holy month, uh, and. Um, so Ramadan is actually a very interesting time to travel uh, anywhere in uh, the Islamic world because um, you you get to sort of witness something that that we well, say we don't really have. I guess those who are devout Catholics uh, celebrate Lent and also have a a degree of fasting. Um, practically speaking, um, there is little to no uh, impact on our uh, trip. Otherwise, we we wouldn't go. Um, but what happens during Ramadan, of course, is that um, Muslims will fast from sunrise to sunset. So they are technically, well, not technically, they're not allowed to eat or drink um, during that whole period of time from sunrise to sunset. Um, what it means is that... Um, uh, some of the things will open a little bit later in the morning, some of the attractions, um, and some of them will close a little bit earlier. As it relates to our itinerary, pretty much no impact. Um, we always time things so that we are amongst the first ones there um, when we're visiting the various temples and archaeological sites along the Nile so that we try to beat the crowds. And again, we have a bit of an ability with our nimble Dahabiya to be able to do that. Um, and so... Um, that's one impact. Other than that, um, you know, we remind travelers uh, when if you're traveling in not just in Egypt, but in, in any Muslim country during Ramadan is to be respectful of the fact that um, that the locals are not eating and drinking during the day. So it's not a great idea to go to McDonald's and grab a burger and start munching on it um, in front of the locals. It's just that's just sort of disrespectful. But um, as it relates to us, obviously, everything happens as usual. Um, so there is, as I say, there's really no other um, um, visible impact. As I say, during the day, at the by the end of the day, um, people tend to be a little more tired and a little bit more lethargic. And, you know, your, uh, your, your, your driver or, you know, whoever it might be that, you know, later on in the afternoon is maybe not as excited and chipper because he hasn't had a bite to eat or a drink of water in 12 hours. Um, uh, and then, of course, when the sun goes down, it's feasting time. So things can be a little bit busy if you're out and about um, in the, you know, in uh, local communities. So you you may see a little bit more frenetic activity after sunset in Cairo, for example, um, as it relates to the experience on the Dahabiya on board the Nile, since we're all amongst our uh, amongst ourselves. Um, you you won't really notice anything. So it's it's an interesting event to witness, and I think it's if anything, it's uh, it um, um, it how shall I say it, it complements the experience of uh, of being in Egypt. Definitely, I think our yeah. members are experiencing that right now in um, Morocco in Mor as well because yes, it was absolutely. a question leading up to our Morocco trip. Um, another question with regards to that was, uh, and I'm. Forgive me if I might have missed it. <laughs> the additional excursion to Abu Simbel, the yeah. pricing member was asking about. Uh, the pricing for the additional trip to Abu Simbel. Which I it will be. Is... Okay. Uh, let me just see if I have it in front of me here on my notes. <laughs> da, 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 da. It's basically the price of the air and the, you know, transferring to the temple and all that. I don't have it right in front of me, Paula. I It'll be to... in the documents as, yeah. yeah. So yeah. for anyone that is inquiring all the pricing, it will be in the itinerary and we have a document with additional information, which helps answer questions you might have, questions you might not know you had yet, but it's a very, members do comment on how, um, what a great resource it is. So you can reach out to Barb and I for that. Um, so no worries, Gordon. I didn't think you'd have it right yeah. in front of you. I, 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 I'm sorry. I don't have it in front of me. That's okay. I, yeah. All good. good um, another question here, which I think a lot of members, um, since we had previously offered the Egypt, Jordan, and Israel at one point together, have yep. been waiting for combination options. So someone was asking if the, they saw Jordan was on the list or other combinations, if um, the dates will line up. And they definitely do for Jordan and Egypt, and Jordan's coming out next month. Exactly. Um, Jordan is we just putting the finishing touches on the trip. We we made some revisions to that because as you say, we previously offered 
uh, the, the trifecta, if you will, Egypt, Israel, and Jordan. We will not be traveling to Israel uh, for the foreseeable future until uh, <clears throat> such time as circumstances there change. But Jordan is is similar. It's adjacent to uh, to all of the troubles, if you will. But at the same time, there's uh, uh, there's no reason not to travel to Jordan. Things are, are are business as usual there. So Egypt and Jordan will be offered in combination, and that program will be out, as you said, in a couple of weeks' time. Fabulous. Yes, that is. Um, and then I have another question here. Members asked with regards to the time of year, um, what is the weather like in terms of how they should pack? to be prepared for the different Yeah, so, so March is, um, when, we, when we first did this trip, we went at the end of January, beginning of February, and uh, quite honestly, it was a little, it was a little chillier than we expected. Um, and, you know, we, we happened to also hit a, a year where it was one of the coldest winters that they've had. Um, believe me, there, there's no snow happening there. Um, but March is sort of past that point. So the weather, the temperatures are optimal. You're talking about temperatures in the low, could hit the mid-20s, um in uh and, and and certainly bright sunshine it doesn't rain much um there particularly not at this time of the year um and cooler in the evening um which means you probably don't even need uh you know the air conditioning in your cabin it's available certainly but for travel wise to this part of the world i think i can't think of it other than november which is the other time we typically operate this trip uh those are the best times of the year because it's it's not it's it's never that cold in Egypt, let's be honest, but it's also not too hot. You can't go, you know, once you get even into uh, into April, um, it starts to get really, really warm during the day, uncomfortably so. So March is the best time for Canadians. Fabulous. Those are the questions that I have received at the moment. And okay. if there's anything other, members can reach out to Barbara or I by phone call or email. Gordon sharing their Details exactly. There. Either Paula or Barbara, this camel here, will be happy to answer all of your questions. Uh, and uh, do do drop us a note. Do join us on this trip. Uh, uh, as I say, I'm 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 delighted that we've had such great feedback from it, and and again, particularly from our amazing host and Egyptologist uh, Eunice. Um, he is a treasure. We're lucky to have him on our team, and he's even more delighted because he thinks that Canadians are um, hilarious and a lot of fun and very easygoing. And he can't say that about others. So that's why this is the one trip that, you know, that we do that he very much looks forward to. So I hope you'll consider joining us to Egypt um, next March um, or one of our other departures. I think we still have some spots in the fall for those that would rather go in the fall. Is there any spots left, Paula? We might have a cabin or two still available off yeah. the top so of if my you're, mind. If I'd you're, if you're itching time. to go earlier, there may still be some space in the fall, but it has been selling quite steadily. And uh, so, uh, but certainly, yeah, drop drop Paula or Barb a note. They'll let you know the status of things. But either way, come next March, you won't regret it. Take care. We'll see you on the next webinar soon. And do we know what the next webinar is? <laughs> the next one is, is on Thursday for Madeira. Yes, which is where I am right now. So that's perfect. So uh, if you want to find out all about a live away in Madeira, this wonderful island of eternal spring that I absolutely adore, I get to be here for another couple of weeks, um, then you can hear firsthand comments from Madeira on Thursday. Uh, details uh, will be in the newsletter as usual. Uh, so watch out for that. Join us for Madeira. Um, take care once again. Have yourselves a great rest of the day. And I look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon.